hey, hey, today is National Calzone Day. That's right, Calzones. I actually really like Calzones. And uh, gosh, you know, okay, so I'm 51 years old. I think the first time I had a Calzone, I was probably 30, maybe. So I actually really love Calzones. Today is a weird day because there's a lot of national things for today. There's National Men Make Dinner. Or it's like man make dinner or something like that, which is weird because I make dinner all the time. So I'm not necessarily celebrating that. And then there's Family Literacy Day. Thankfully, my entire family knows how to read and write. So I thought, hey, I'll just celebrate National Calzone Day. <laughs> so without further ado, do you want to mention the Daily Dope is in the air? Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I'm Jeff McAleer back once again as your host here at The Daily Dope, presented by TheGamingGang.com. Today is episode 189 of The Daily Dope. Crazy. Closing it on 200 pretty fast, pretty quickly. So today I am actually going to be reviewing the hardcover edition of Vampire the Masquerade, 5th edition. A lot of people are just calling it V5. It is from White Wolf Publishing and Modifius Entertainment. So I will be reviewing the hardcover in just a bit. Do have some news today. Not a ton of news, but I do have some news. So I do want to uh, point out that this is a live stream. I know a lot of people end up watching this after the fact. But if you are tuning in and uh, checking this out on YouTube, there is chat available. So it is not on screen. It's one of the ways that I kind of keep some of the stranger commenters at bay. But I do follow the chat. I keep an eye on the chat. So if you have a question or you want to say hello, or maybe you want to ask something about Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition, by all means, chime in and I will respond. Do want to also thank the war gamers out there. I... I always have a really good wargaming following for people who tune in for the various uh, coverage I do on Wednesdays. So I want to say, hey, thanks to uh, the Gronyars out there and uh, always appreciate you tuning in. And some of some of the wargamers out there, they watch more than just, you know, Wednesday shows. So anyway, if uh, this is the first time stopping by, this is a very casual show. Uh, if you like the stream by all means subscribe to the gaming gang channel and uh, if you like the video give it a thumbs up if you can't stand it i understand you give it a thumbs down you know it's your prerogative okay also do want to point out there is news today so if you are watching this after the fact after the live stream and you do not care about the gaming news take a look at the show notes i have timestamps there you can click ahead you don't have to watch the news You'd be amazed. I get these people who, who put comments up about, oh, I can't believe it was like 20 minutes of ads. It's 20 minutes of game news. Same same stuff you read on websites about the games you're interested in. I'm just presenting it to you as like news pieces. So speaking of the news, let's jump on in because Tasty Minstrel is re-releasing a Euro-style dice placement favorite next week. And I've got the dope on Vienna. Mm. Setting foot on the streets of 19th century Vienna for the first time, you gaze in awe at the magnificent buildings of the old imperial city from your coach window. Overwhelmed by all the possibilities the metropolis has to offer, you begin to ask yourself all sorts of important questions. Where should you place your dice so that you can end up with the most victory points? Yes. That's what I would be thinking as I'm riding in a coach through Vienna. Should you go after quick rewards? Or would you be better off looking for influential people in the heart of the city? Of course, your fate will be determined by not only your own strategic decisions, but by your rival's plans and the luck of the dice. At the end of the game, the player who plans his path with the most foresight and skill places his dice wisest will prevail. Vienna offers an intriguing game idea in a wonderfully detailed setting. 
Get yourself, let yourself be carried away into this fantastic, nostalgic world. You'll be faced with many important questions in Vienna, many which involve where to place your dice so you can get a hold of as many victory points as possible. Naturally, these tactical decisions will be influenced by the plans of others and by the favor of the dice. In the end, whoever plans best and uses her resources will win. Vienna is for three to five players, ages 14 and up, plays in around an hour, and it will carry an MSRP of $49.95 when it arrives next week on November 6th. Very, very cool. Uh, I am sharing some images that are not from the um, Tasty Mitchell Games edition, but I believe it's the same. I don't think anything has really changed. I just think that this is an English language uh, printing of Vienna. I'm not positive if it was out in English before. So it's it may not have been, but I do believe the game originally came out, I think maybe 2016. So looks kind of interesting. If you like dice placement games, you know, um, what the heck is the one? Kingsburg? Is, it, is that it? I don't remember. It's kind of like the fantasy dice placement game. I thought that was okay. I thought that was all right. Hey, you know what? Speaking of reprints, there's another reprint on the horizon, and this one is a family-friendly game from Daily Magic Games. And I've got the dope on crabs. You know I'm going to have a joke about this. You know it. In crabs, you and your fellow crabbers will be catching, raising, and selling crabs to the market for points. Get ready to gather your gear and head to the beach where vendors are lining up to collect the crabs you catch. Is that how that works? I don't think that's how that works. I don't think so. I don't think this is being realistic. <laughs> just kidding. Choose your prizes wisely and you might just shell out this shellfish they need. Race to snatch up as many crabs as you can or upgrade your gear to improve your chances of nabbing yourself a star. Compete with your friends to find out who is the true crabbing king. I'm king of the world, ma, king of the world. Shuffle up the crab cards and deal out a hand of cards to each player and then form the crab pool. Players take turns trying to raise or catch the right crabs to sell to the market. First player to accumulate 25 points on their turn triggers the final round. Whoever has the most points by the end of that round wins the game. Each turn, you can choose one of the following actions. Catch, draw two cards from the deck or pool. Raise, exchange cards with the pool, crabs for crabs. Trade, exchange cards with the pool, points for points. Upgrade, discard cards to upgrade your gear level. Tie crabs, discard cards to gain a scorecard. Or you can relax and up, untap up to three scorecards. Crabs is for two to five players, ages 10 and up, plays in about 30 minutes, and will carry an MSRP of $20 when it returns to print on November 21st. Like the artwork, of course I have to joke, you know, I've always tried to avoid catching crabs. But um bumps. Yeah, I know that was an obvious joke there, wasn't it? Uh, like the art style, looks kind of fun. And uh, I believe, I believe this was originally a Japanese game. I'm pretty sure. And uh, I believe this has been out of print for a while. So I'm not sure if this is the first time Daily Magic Games is printing crabs or not. But uh, looks looks kind of fun. Fun for the whole family. Plays about a half hour. Nice wind up, wind down sort of game. All right, so today's Thursday, and those of you who follow the Daily Dope know on Thursday that uh, I like to talk RPGs. That's why I'm reviewing Vampire the Masquerade today. And one of the most anticipated role-playing games of 2018 has arrived in both print and in PDF. And here's the dope on Legend of the Five Rings. Fantasy Flight Games is proud to announce the Legend of the Five Rings role-playing core rulebook. At 336 pages, the Legend of the Five Rings role-playing core rulebook allows game masters and players to enter the world of Rokugan like never before. 
The core rulebook is the next step for players after the Legend of the Five Rings role-playing beginner box and offers players new ways to customize their characters and craft their own adventures in the Emerald Empire. The Emerald Empire stretches out before you, a land of honor and tradition, divided by the seven great clans and united under the rule of the Emperor. Whether you're caught in a web of intrigue and lies at the Emperor's winter court, investigating the murder of a prominent official, or battling against the encroaching Shadowlands, the world of Legend of the Five Rings is full of adventures, and now you can embark on those adventures for yourself. Legend of the Five Rings role-playing core rulebook, well, that is kind of a mouthful, is now available, giving you everything that you need to create your own characters, forge an adventure, and start role-playing in the Emerald Empire. The core rulebook isn't releasing on its own, however. Even the most skilled samurai still need to pass skill checks. And the Legend of the Five Rings role-playing dice pack gives you the ring dice and skill dice you need to play. Finally, the Game Master's Kit offers an invaluable accessory for Game Masters, complete with a deluxe screen and a pre-written adventure to jumpstart your journeys into Rokugan. You can score the 336-page hardcover book from your friendly local game store or the Fantasy Flight Games web store for $49.95 or as of just the other day, I think it was yesterday maybe, might have been this morning. You can get the PDF from DriveThruRPG for $24.95. Cool beans. I have to point out, I love L5R when AEG handled the property. When they were doing the role-playing books, it was top-notch quality all the way through. And I really liked the, uh, the kind of meta plot that the game had because it was also tied into the collectible card game, which is a little different now that that pr this property, both properties, actually the whole, everything L5R is with Fantasy Flight Games. It's now a living card game. It's no longer a collectible card game. This does look like some really awesome production quality. Don't know how the game plays. Uh, it is not the same mechanics as previously in L5R. So, of course, now you've got the custom dice. FFG's big on that. So I'd be interesting, uh, interesting. I'd be interested <laughs> in kind of taking a peek, see how this book looks. Because like I said, L5R was very, very cool. And on a, on a funny kind of side note, uh, when I talked to John Zinzer at Origins, we were talking a little bit off the record. And uh, one of the things that we were talking about was role-playing games and AEG, and I had mentioned that I was sad to see L5R, you know, leave AEG because they had done such a great job on the role-playing game. And uh, John had mentioned that uh, that was one aspect of the new direction that AEG had gone in that he felt a little bad about was that they weren't going to have a role-playing game that they supported. I don't think they miss getting out of the collectible card game business, but uh, I'm sure I know for a fact John misses the role-playing game aspect because that's where Alderac Entertainment comes from. Alderac was like the world of his first uh, role-playing game campaign that he created. So just a little side note there, folks. So yes, uh, L5R looks pretty cool. The beginner's box looked pretty neat as well. All right, talking about cool things. There is an interesting seeming role-playing game that's arrived from Broken Ruler Games, and I've got the dope on High Plains Samurai. A story game of gunslingers, samurais, gangsters, barbarians, and steampunk in a post-apocalyptic world with superpowers. Blah, blah, blah. Maybe they should be calling this game Kitchen Sink. We were once a beautiful world, young and fertile. Nothing but hope and opportunity lay before us. We were the chosen ones of our creators and lived a lavish lifestyle. Until the All-Father revealed his jealousy at the love of his children gave to their creation and not him. His wrath nearly wiped us out. Now we are the enslaved and oppressed living in the five cities or risking it all in the wastes. But there are some who call no place home 
they wander between all places and live by their own rules. Will any of them rise up to become the mysterious heroes we need? That sounds like Gotham City. The High Plains Samurai role-playing game is a tabletop story game about gunslingers, barbarians, samurai, gangsters, and steampunk in a post-apocalyptic world of superpowers. Everything you need to take on the mantle of writers and directors telling the first draft of an original story in the one land. A story that may one day save these people from oblivion. Built using the Screenplay Engine, HPS is a collaborative story game with all players taking an equal role in the storytelling process. Players take on the role of writers, working with the director to draft complete stories of action, suspense, horror, and survival. Through their lead characters, writers actively drive the story and create epic action sequences as the central storytellers. The director reacts to their descriptions while simultaneously challenging their characters along the way. For every description moving the story forward, another player will deliver its outcome to push it further, react to events, and embellish details with camera angles, special effects, even a character's demise. Sounds a bit like a Powered by the Apocalypse game. So wouldn't be shocked if uh, if it may owe a little bit to Apocalypse Engine. Anyway, you can grab the 140-page PDF for $15 from DriveThruRPG, or you can order the softcover or hardcover books from the Broken Ruler website. Have to admit, this seems pretty interesting. Uh, seems like a game where the writers, I guess the pl the players, because it seems like the director is kind of like the game master, uh, where the writers have to uh, the the game the players have to be able to kind of distance themselves from their characters, right? It's not going to be your kind of typical like Pathfinder D and D sort of. Oh well, this is my character, and this is all I really have to worry about. So seems pretty interesting. Although I got to say one thing. 15 bucks for a 140 page PDF. That's pricey. That is really pricey. And the weird thing is the uh, free quick start rules for High Plains Samurai won a gold any award. So I'm kind of surprised, you know, when you're looking at more than 10 cents a page for a PDF, that's a tough sell. That's a really tough sell. But as I said, this does seem pretty interesting. All right, so that's it for the news today. So before I jump into my review of Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition, I do want to cover a few different things. Uh, first off, what's uh, on the horizon for episodes of The Daily Dope? So first off, and I'm going to kind of move this here, because I, once again, whenever I get a book or something, I usually try to you know, prop it up with uh, something that's coming up on the show. So on tomorrow's show, I am going to be taking a first look at the retail edition of the second edition of Block by Block, the Insurrection game, which I did a uh, pretty detailed preview video for the Kickstarter for this. So we're going to take a look to see what the actual retail edition looks like. Then on Monday's show, we're going to take a look to see what the new expansion for Ascension Delirium brings to the table. So that's going to be on Monday's show. On Tuesday, I am going to review The Captain is Dead Lockdown from AG. So I will have that. Uh, also next week, I'm going to try to get um, a review in for Cryptid, which is right over here. Uh, we have gotten a, a play in of it, but uh, my my policy is for uh, for board games. I got to play it three times before I do a review. So I do not have three playthroughs yet. It's pretty interesting. Kind of like it, <laughs> but I'll give you a hint. Unless somehow we're playing it wrong and <laughs> we find that out, you know, <laughs> in a future playthrough where it's like, whoa, we're playing this completely wrong. This game stinks. Nah, usually it's the opposite. The <laughs> first time we play, it's like, yeah, this game's not very good. And then it's like, oh, wait, uh, we have that those couple of rules wrong or something. So that's what's uh, on the agenda for next week. I'll have some GMT on Wednesday for Wargame Wednesday. 
next Thursday. Not sure. Not sure uh, role playing game wise. Might do some PDFs. I've been reading through some PDFs. So I might do some Powered by the Apocalypse. So I don't know. We'll find out. But the other thing I do want to talk about too is that we've got our charity stream for Extra Life coming up on Saturday, November 3rd. So I did want to share what we've got cooking. Of course, the beneficiary of the Extra Life charity is the Children's Miracle Network of Hospitals. And uh, we do um, the uh, Robert, I want to say it's Robert H. Laurie. It's like Ann and Robert H. Laurie Children's Hospital of Chicago is the hospital that we play for. Anyway, so I do have my lineup almost completely set in stone. So I'm going to let you know what we're tackling, what we're playing on Saturday, what time, and more importantly, maybe kind of giveaways we got going on because unlike a lot of streams, we got giveaways cooking for people who donate. Uh, so it's uh, the giveaways are, are basically whoever is the highest, whoever makes the highest donation during that block, because we're breaking things up into two hour blocks, are going to win that giveaway. So first off, Saturday morning, 10 a.m., I should say from 8 a.m. till 10 a.m., because we're, we're playing 12 hours. We are going to play the Lost Expedition from Osprey Games. Cameron and I are big fans of this, really, really enjoy this. There is a new expansion that's probably in the mail right now. I should probably be getting it any day. Uh, it is um, the Fountain of Youth and Other Tales. So doubt if I'm going to have that by Sunday or actually have been able to read it by Sunday. So we're going to play the core game, The Lost Expedition, but we have a giveaway from Osprey Games. So highest donation during that period, that two hour period is going to get The Lost Expedition as well as the new expansion, Fountain of Youth and Other Tales. So pretty sweet. So that's going to be the first giveaway and that's our first segment. Uh, then we have at 10 a.m. from 10 to 12, we are going to play Everdell, which I've got right here. I didn't want to put everything we're playing out where I'm just lifting all this stuff. <laughs> I have a stack next to me, right? So we're going to be playing Everdell from 10 till noon. Once again, this is Central Standard Time. Everdell's from Starling Games. Once again, another really fun game. Really, really dug it. We do have a giveaway from... Um, Flying Meeple Games, which is kind of an imprint of Starling. It's going to be a three-pack of family fun. So it's going to be Ella Minis, Gimme Gimme Guinea Pigs, and Dig Dog Dig. Uh, that three-pack is going to go to the highest donator during our segment. We can't give out Everdell because Everdell sold out. So it is uh, sold out, I believe, at the distributor level. So what that basically means is Starling Games doesn't have any copies of it left. So there's no way for us to do a giveaway from Starling Games when they don't have it, right? So, uh, but pretty cool. We'll have a, have a three pack of family games to be giving away as well. So from 10 to, I should say from 12 to two, I have been trying to get a hold of Gameland Games cause I would like to do a double dip and do Tiny Epic Zombies, which is their newest release, as well as Tiny Epic Galaxies, because we really dig Tiny Epic Galaxies and Tiny Epic Zombies. Uh, but I have not heard back. I have not heard back if we're going to have some sort of giveaway. So I don't know. I do not know just yet. So uh, could be from 12 to 2, we don't do Gameland Games because we, there are a few other companies that are kind of chatting with me a little bit about trying to get on board, getting a segment in because they want to give some stuff away. So Gameland's kind of up in the air for that. From 2 to 4, we are going to be playing Axis and Allies and Zombies, the brand new release that just came out last Friday from Avalon Hill. So we're going to be playing this. I highly doubt we're going to get a complete game in, but we will get to show it off a little bit and uh, play a bit as well. Cool thing is we got a copy of Axis and Allies and Zombies to give away to the highs donator during the 2 to 4 p.m. slot. Then from 4 to 6, it's still up 
for debate, but what I'm trying to do is, um, well, I don't want to say who we might be doing, uh, but I will know positively by later on tonight. And then from six to eight, Elliot Miller, my best friend, or at voiceofe.com, used to be a member of the Gaming Gang. He was a co-founder of the Gaming Gang. Might see him come back one of these days too, because he's kind of been on this hiatus from Voice of E for a long time now. But we are gonna go head to head and we are gonna play 1960, The Making of the President from GMT Games. I have some giveaways that I've got planned. Um, I will talk about it during the stream itself, but probably looking at at least one giveaway for one of the new reprints of the coin series from GMT Games. I've got A Distant Plane, I've got Andy and Abyss, and I also have uh, Fire in the Lake, which is the uh, the Vietnam one. So uh, brand new prints just came out. So at least one of those is gonna be a giveaway to the high uh, donator, the highest donation, I guess we'll say, during that, uh, that segment as well. So, so far, trying to make sure we've got giveaways for every single segment. I do also want to point out that Craig Van Ness over at Soaring Rhino Games was kind enough to have it sitting around. Did I put it back someplace or is it in the car? I don't know. Uh, I just reviewed last week uh, Shifting Realms from Soaring Rhino Games. Really enjoyed it. It's really good. Craig Van Ness has been kind enough to offer us two copies of Shifting Realms, which carries like an MSRP of $75. Two copies for us to give away during our stream as well. So even if you're not going to uh, make any sort of a donation or anything like that, please tune in. It's going to be right here on the Gaming Gang YouTube channel anyway. Tune in. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to kid around. Just just join us, right? I'm not, I'm not twisting anybody's arm to make a donation or anything like that. We will mention it throughout the stream. But uh, we're not going to bang anybody over the head. But we, we do want people to kind of kind of tune in and have fun with us. So if you don't have anything too exciting cooking on Saturday, by all means, pop on in. And of course, uh, we will have chat. Though we probably won't be able to like type responses in chat, <laughs> you know. But uh, we will be able to uh, to follow chat as well. And in fact, I think Elliot's wife is going to kind of kind of moderate the chat for us to kind of keep an eye on things because we'll be in the midst of playing stuff. Can't constantly be like, oh, what's what's up on screen on the chat? Okay, so that is it for the news and everything else today. I know there are loads of people. Well, maybe not loads. I know I know there are people who are checking out this video because they want to see my review of Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition from White Wolf Publishing and Modifius Entertainment. It is written by Kenneth Height. I always say Ken Height. Mark Ryan Hagen, Matthew Dawkins, Juliana, I think it's Juana? J-U-H-A-N-N-A Peterson. Hey, at least the last name's easy to pronounce. Martin Erickson and Kareem Mumar. Mumar? Taking a guess. The 400-page hardcover which is what I'm reviewing, is available for $51.99 through Modifius because they are the publisher. And the 421-page PDF is available for $24.99 through DriveThruRPG. Real quickly, before I jump in, do want to point out that the Gaming Gang is an affiliate of the DriveThru sites. If you are going to make a purchase at one of the DriveThru sites, please go to thegaminggang.com first click on one of our banners and that way if you make a small you know any purchase you make we get a small portion of that sale which really helps keep the gaming gang around i can't stress that enough all right so enough of the, about that let's move on over to the other camera so let me pop on the old reading specs so it wasn't too long ago that i went through a uh you know, we took a first look at this, and I paged through Vampire the Masquerade. So, a uh, few things uh, I'm going to address right off the bat. So, Vampire the Masquerade, this new 5th edition, is for mature audiences. It is rated 18 and up. That is the recommended age 
uh, appropriate material is what they're saying here is 18 and up. I thoroughly agree with that. Uh, there are some things that we're probably going to, uh, I am probably going to kind of um, mention or kind of talk a little bit about that uh, people out there might not be very comfortable with. And to be honest, probably a lot of gamers won't be comfortable with either. So I do want to point that out as well. Um, because this is for mature audiences, I figure I, I might drop an F-bomb or two during this review. I'm not sure. I'm just, you know, if you watch my reviews, you know, I just kind of, you know, I talk. It's I don't have anything all scripted out or anything like that. So as I'm going to start paging through here, I'm going to address a few elephants in the room. Uh, we've got, let's make sure we got this kind of squared up here. There we go. I don't want my my mug, you know, kind of uh, blocking off some of the book. Because once again, I'm going to page through this, but I'm going to do it a little bit quicker than the uh, the first look. So I thought the, we got the front and the back. We've got some 50 victims, different kinds of victims uh, you can utilize for the vampires. Uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. I do want to point out that I am going to give away a PDF copy of Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition. Going to make it super easy. Just got to uh, got to subscribe to the channel and just comment on this video. That's all I got to do. And uh, what I will do is uh, I will choose a winner and I will announce it on next Thursday's show. I will announce the winner on next Thursday's show. Uh, touch base with them on YouTube and uh, have them give me their email address. And uh, I will actually send them the code, special download code for them to get a uh, PDF because when you purchase the hardcover, you also get a copy of the PDF. There's a code in on the one of the back pages here, which I will not show off uh, that entitles you to the PDF download. I don't need it because I have the book. I also got a review copy of the PDF, so I'm going to give that code away. All right, just grabbing a quick sip here. So let's address a few elephants in the room as we kind of flip through here. Um, there are going to be, be people out there who are just going to despise this edition of Vampire the Masquerade. There are people out there who are going to love this edition of Vampire the Masquerade. I'll just say V5. Uh, there are people out there who will hate this just because it's vampire. Uh, there will be people out there who will just sing its praises without even actually picking this up because it's vampire. So that just, you know, that happens to be the case, right? So the the book is going to start off with a bunch of a bunch of background. Uh, I kind of like the way this is laid out and then in other ways I sort of don't. Uh, it looks pretty nice. I think it's kind of cool, but uh, this like opening like fiction, it's supposed to be Mina Harker. Eh, it's, it's all right. So you're going to find that a lot of the background, a lot of the fiction is kind of set up like this. You're going to actually go through uh, quite a lot of the book early on is devoted to introducing Vampire the Masquerade to new players and kind of explaining to longtime players, longtime gamers, uh, or fans of Vampire the Masquerade, what changes have been made. So one thing that uh, I'm looking at, the way I'm, I'm approaching this review is as someone who has a little bit of knowledge about Vampire because back when Vampire first came out, I had the core book, I had the uh, Chicago source book. I think I had like three of the first supplements that came out Never ran it. Uh, I enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty cool. And I, like others out there, were kind of like, wow, this meta plot is, is pretty interesting. And then, as I mentioned, there are going to be people who, who just are going to despise this because it's vampire. And one of the reasons is because back in the day, Vampire the Masquerade was super hot. You had gaming stores that only had so much shelf space that they were going to devote to role-playing games. And 
all you did is you walked in there and it was just splat book after splat book from Vampire or other World of Darkness uh, releases. And people were, you know, people who were into other role playing games were upset. And a lot of role playing game companies couldn't get their products on, on store shelves because of White Wolf Publishing and their World of Darkness. So there are people out there who just have a, you know, a hatred for all things White Wolf simply because of that. I myself, I have absolutely no dog in the fight. I think I've mentioned time and time again, Call of Cthulhu is my role-playing game that I have run for decades. So that means that I don't necessarily have like, you know, any pro or con against any other sort of role-playing game. I, I approach things just from, you know, from a new gamer, like like a new player, a new game master's point of view. So the way I'm approaching this is, does this, how, how well does this core book, this new core book approach presenting the whole vampire, the masquerade mystique and background and everything to new players? How easy are the concepts of the mechanics to grasp? How crunchy are the rules for this? And, you know, I can kind of toss out there what maybe longtime fans of World of Darkness might dig or might not dig. So as we page through here, looking at the just the presentation alone, outside of some, some areas where it's kind of like a little bit cluttered like this, it's all fairly straightforward. We don't get kind of like overdosed with a lot of, uh, with too much clutter, I guess we'll say. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, I do like that. One thing I will mention, uh, Vampire the Masquerade, the book is actually produced by Modifius Entertainment. Interesting side note, Modifius wasn't actually the first publisher that was approached about publishing the new edition of Vampire the Masquerade. That said, I'm not going to kind of go into the whole, you know, the first publisher decided, you know what, it's, there's some stuff that's, you know, a little, little too, uh, a little too hot. Topic's a little too hot that they didn't want to kind of tackle. So they said, no, you know what, we're not interested. Uh, so that's when Modifius Entertainment came in uh, to uh, handle the production of the book. The reason why I mention this is that the production quality of this book is fantastic. It's really, really nicely done. So just because it didn't go with like the big name in European role-playing games doesn't mean that this book is lacking in production quality because it is top notch. Granted, okay, so it doesn't have a, um, a bookmark. <laughs> so I guess that might give you a clue on who was originally gonna publish this. So anyway, so as I mentioned, just uh, page stock, everything is really, really nice. Other thing you're going to notice too is uh, a lot of photography, and I think a lot of longtime fans of World of Darkness and Vampire the Masquerade might end up being upset that there is no Tim Bradstreet artwork involved in this, uh, and Bradstreet is known for loads and loads of World of Darkness artwork, very iconic artwork. Um, you're not going to find it in here. So I'm sure that uh, that will upset some folks. I'm sure some folks are going to be upset that the, it's a lot of photography. Um, lots and lots of photography in here. Of course, there is some artwork. But uh, I would say we're probably looking at like 70-30 as far as photography versus um, line art. Anyway, so... Kind of going through uh, some of the things that I've noticed as far as from my understanding of Vampire the Masquerade over the years is, as I mentioned, the, the meta plot was something that really drew a lot of people in. A lot of people were actually buying the splat books from World of Darkness because of the over, you know, just overarching meta plot. And they weren't actually even, re, you know, running the games. So in some ways, people really dug the meta plot. Otherwise, 
some folks didn't because they felt that, hey, they were too tied into those events for the player characters to really be making a huge impact in the game world. Well, there have been a bunch of changes. Um, the elders are kind of gone. So the player characters do have a lot of uh, freedom to, uh, to rise through the ranks, I guess we would say. Uh, another aspect of Vampire that may have been a turnoff for some people is that uh, all the different clans and that just became so convoluted. All these different things you had to keep track of, all these different clan books, things like that. Um, vampire back in the day was probably a little too white Eurocentric for some people's tastes these days. So it is nice to see that uh, there is quite a bit of diversity being shared in the core book here. Um, so that I thought was pretty cool. Um, but those of those fans out there who are like really into all the, you know, oh, well, you know, this clan, I you know I, my, my player character is going to be got to be this clan because of all this background, all this history and so on and so forth might be a little disappointed because they haven't trimmed down the number of clans, but they have taken a lot of a lot of things that are going on in like the meta plot and moved it, I guess we'll say off screen. That, uh, and I, I actually, personally, I think that's pretty cool. I like that because um, the way Vampire used to be was that, you know, your, your player characters, even after you had played a while, at least from, you know, kind of the way I took it, um, still could make that big of an impact on, on the game world, right? Uh, here, in this situation, they can. Uh, the way this setting is set up, they can. Anyway, so you notice right off the bat, I mean, we are 100 pages in here, and we are still looking at the various different clans. There's some kind of odd artwork or, or photography in here. Um, so like I said, some people are going to like it. Some people are going to dislike it. Uh, then we'd go talking about the thin blooded. So just moving along. Okay. So what do we go? How far did we have to go? 114 pages. Now we get into the rules. So here's kind of an odd golden rule for V5. I, and it, I, I find it kind of funny because I'm doing a review on the book, and of course, what we got right here, we're in the rules section. So the golden rule of Vampire <laughs> the Masquerade 5th Edition is there are no rules. You do, you know, take what you want, leave behind what you don't want. You like this aspect of the rules, use that as a framework. If you don't like this, toss it out. So it's not unusual to see a role-playing game product kind of throw that out there hey the golden rule is there are no rules sort of thing right they do really mean they're not necessarily saying hey just disregard everything that we've got in this book absolutely not um but here there's kind of like more of like a real emphasis of hey seriously uh use what take what you want leave behind what you don't so Mechanically, if you if you checked out some of my role playing game reviews in the past, I don't delve a whole lot into mechanics simply because I find them kind of boring. Uh, as someone who has actually run role playing games for decades, mechanics are not the the selling point to me. I know they are for other people out there. They really aren't. To me, I don't know. Uh, if I run across a mechanic that I think is interesting, I'll be like, oh, cool. I might cannibalize that to utilize that for uh, a game that, you know, I'm running as opposed to actually running the game that that mechanic came from. Vampire the Masquerade has always been known as a very rules light system. That's why uh, so many people uh, involve themselves in, in Vampire through LARPs because you don't have a really crunchy system of mechanics that you have to worry about. That has changed a little bit from what I originally remember with the first edition of Vampire. Now, you know, there's, you know, you got Vampire the Requiem, you got the 20th anniversary Vampire. I mean, 
I don't know what all has changed over the years. I can only tell you about what I remember when Vampire first came out. So from what I recall from the original Vampire, it was very, very uh, rules light. Now, I'm not saying that this is overly crunchy. It's not because in essence, what it really breaks down to is the mechanics of the game. You're using 10 sided dice. So you got your 10 sided dice. So you're rolling for successes. So if you roll a six or higher, that's considered a success. Uh, one to five is failure. Six to 10 is success. Now, if you get a 10, then you're looking at um, kind of a, an especially good success, especially if you roll more than one 10. So you have a dice pool. So the dice pool is basically, you're gonna take your attribute, your skill, or what have you, you're gonna have, you're gonna have two different things you're gonna add together, so you've got a dice pool. So your dice pool could be five dice, could be eight dice, could be 10 dice. The game master is gonna say, okay, so this has a difficulty of, let's say five, right? So, okay, what you're trying to do has a difficulty of five, you're gonna take your 10 sided dice, you're gonna roll your pool, and you're basically looking for five successes to be able to pull that off. So what'll happen is if you actually get two tens out of your dice pool, you're gonna double those successes. So for an example, if let's say you've got a dice pool of five dice and you roll the five dice and you get two tens, those two tens right there are gonna count for four successes. So not all that difficult to wrap your heads around. I mean, and that really is kind of the whole mechanic to the game is your 10 sided dice, your dice pulls. There's a lot of other stuff involved. Don't get me wrong. I don't want people to, you know, be commenting going, oh, you simplified everything way too much. Once again, as I mentioned, I am not a big uh, proponent of mechanics. I don't care. I, I look more at setting. I look at presentation. I look at, hey, as I'm reading this, do I want to play in this world? Do I want to jump in and, and play in this, this game world? As opposed to, hey, man, I, they don't have grappling rules? What the hell, man? I can't play this game. There's no grappling rules. Or I can't min-max this. This I don't like this at all. So I was talking about the golden rule. It says the most important rule of all and the only real rule worth following. There are no rules. This game should be whatever you want it to be, whether that's nearly diceless chronicle of in-character social, socialization or a long-running tactical campaign with each player controlling a small coterie of vampires. Like I said, they really take this to heart here as far as, hey, you know what? Golden rule is no rules, which is sort of funny. So how are you supposed to re review the rules, right? If you could just throw everything out. So then we go into, we've got uh, character creation. Character creation's pretty... Okay, so to me, character creation seems to probably be a little more complex, a little more involved than I seem to recall it used to be. But one of the cool things is that uh, you're gonna be looking at um, how your vampire feeds. So I thought that was kind of kind of interesting. It, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the game mechanically, but it does, um, does have a lot to do with how you role play your vampire. So for an example, you might have a vampire who, you know, they call it the bagger, right? So they, they don't actually feed off of like a human being or they or an animal or what have you. They actually will go to like blood banks or they, you know, they're, they're, they're paying through the black market for blood, stuff like that. So there's all different aspects to that. I, so I thought that was kind of cool. So you really have core traits here, strength, dexterity, stamina, you got charisma, manipulation, composure, you got intelligence, wits, resolve, and then you've got willpower. Then you start going into the skills. Like, remember I said, okay, so you're gonna have this dice pool, so you're gonna have the dice from here, you're gonna have the dice from skills as well. So just talking about different skills throughout. Uh, as far as uh, time to take to roll up a character, probably along the same lines of Fifth edition D and D is what I would say. Uh, like I said, I seem I seem to think I, I think it seems to me I should say that it the rolling of a, a new character takes a bit more time 
with this edition than it did in past editions. Uh, there are also kind of, oh, see, predator types. That's what I was talking about. How, how do you feed? How, how does the vampire feed? So, um, oh, see, I lost my train of thought there for a sec. There we go. There's the bagger, blood leech, cleaver, consensualist, sandman. Then we got uh, different advantages. Uh, different backgrounds. Said so kind of, you know, this this is actually the cover photograph. Like I said some people like the like the photography. Some people are gonna go. Eh. So then we start going into um, the vampires themselves. Okay, so once again, here's here's another aspect of. Vampire the Masquerade that new players, I'm not talking about people coming from other versions, other editions, I'm saying new players, probably need to know about, um, we're not talking, we're not talking about uh, sparkly vampires, we're not talking about, uh, well, even Anne Rice, even Anne Rice's stories, uh, not, some of her vampires, you know, like um, Louie, they're, you know, they struggle with their humanity. Right, some some vampires are not necessarily you know monsters, right? Vampire of the Masquerade, you're a monster. That is pretty much what you're looking at. Uh, there's really no two ways about it. You can try to be you know a a virtuous character, I guess we would say, a try to be a non-evil character, but that's really not how this works. So, uh, in fact, and I, I should have mentioned this when I first started talking about this review, there is a difference in page count, right? So this, this hardcover is just under, it's like 400 pages if you count like the character sheet. The PDF is 421 pages. There's actually material, and it is available as a free download uh, in PDF. There's material that was not in this core book. So not only is there uh, errata, there is also um, kind of a disclaimer that talks about, hey, you know, this game is about monsters. Don't make this game about okaying monstrous behavior. <laughs> you know, not not being cool with monstrous behavior. It's not uh, don't become the monster that you're playing in the game kind of thing, which uh, I found a little odd, right? But you know. Maybe I'm a little different. Maybe I, you know, I, I discern reality from fantasy a lot easier than some other people do. Um, then there is also a, uh, a nice long section about that that discusses um, what's appropriate at your game table, right? How to, you know, how to approach this kind of in the vein, no pun intended, as the designers uh, would like this to be without going overboard. Uh, because if you, if you really, if you look at this book and you think about the way that vampires are presented, the way this world is presented, there's some pretty tough things to swallow in this. Now, granted, probably, you know, scratching the surface of the real world a little too closely for, for some, but I mean, there's, you know, if you think about it, there's, uh, violence against children, uh, there's sexual assault, there's um, domination of others, um, just, you know, there's, there's just a lot of stuff in this um, that's kind of desensitizing if you, if you, you know, just dive on into this, right? So I uh, do want to point that out, that, you know, for those gamers out there who are like, ooh, you know, I want to, I want to play like a Twilight kind of uh, vampire game. This ain't it, Bubba. This just ain't it. So, something, a uh, new aspect to the game that I think is kind of cool is the hunger mechanic. So, the hunger mechanic basically is about um, when did your vampire last feed? Like, how, you know, like, uh, how topped off are they? <laughs> I guess we would say blood-wise. And uh, you, you actually have hunger dice. So, with the hunger dice, what happens is Let's say you, you're like your hunger level two kind of thing. So you're going to replace two of your regular dice from your dice pool with hunger dice, which can still be 
a, um, could be a success, right? But if they're failure, it makes your failure that much larger because the whole thing is, the whole premise is, you know, vampires exist among us and they're, you know, they're hidden away. They, they lurk in the shadows. Um, it's kind of tough to do that when you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I'm jonesing for a blood fix, right? Uh, then we start getting into some stuff about blood itself, different kinds of blood and, and things along the lines of uh, different characters having different uh, like bonuses to their blood that if you feed on those characters that that carries over into your character. Kind of interesting stuff, kind of oddball stuff. Once again, it is going to be uh, kind of up to the, the players themselves if they want to start utilizing some of this stuff. Because it kind of, you know, it starts getting into creepy territory, right? Oh, well, you know, Joe Bob over here, he's, he's got that certain blood that I just love so much. So uh, we actually have him imprisoned here that I feed off him. And uh, yeah, kind of weird, a little strange. Another aspect is humanity. When I was talking about that you're playing a monster, you are, and you are constantly struggling to retain humanity, which it's actually, it's a losing proposition. You're, you're eventually going to, um, it's, you know, if you're playing a long-term campaign, uh, your character is going to end up really, you know, becoming more and more vicious and less human. Let me go into some disciplines here. Uh, which is, you know, kind of like magic, right? It's sort of like the magic of vampire. So we've got that. Uh, there's various different um, aspects for characters to actually um, create potions and things like that that kind of mimic different uh, disciplines, things like that. So quite a lot of info here as far as the different disciplines. Blood sorcery. All right, continuing to move on through here. Uh, alchemy. That's where you're. I'm talking about where you can like kind of kind of brew these potions, create these potions that uh, that mimic a lot of the um, the disciplines themselves. Then we got advanced systems, which you start getting into rules where it's like, okay, so depending on how crunchy you want this game to be or the kind of direction you, or kind of tone that you want your Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition campaign to take, we've got these here. Scenes and modes, extended tests, the Hunger Game. Uh, there is kind of a an approach to this where it's kind of like the rule of three. So it's sort of like any any aspect, any kind of task or conflict resolution you're trying to resolve uh, should come down to three rolls of the dice and that is it. You don't want to have to, you know, just keep rolling on and on and on and on and on. Uh, so, uh, talking about uh, as far as like combat and just really things that go into a lot of detail when you're going to sit there and just be rolling dice for a few minutes at a time uh, the designers kind of, you know, are, are are telling you, hey, you know what? It's better if the game master just makes a decision on something like that, as opposed to rolling dice ad nauseum. So we've got advanced conflict, social combat. We had combat. I was just flipping through here. Systems of blood, of the blood, I should say. One thing that I found kind of, kind of weird about this, and maybe it's only because I have been reading so much Powered by the Apocalypse uh, stuff lately, is, and uh, now we get into cities. Now, once again, one of the things that, uh, a little bit different here than in previous editions, you know, like, previous editions of Vampire, you had, like, Chicago. Chicago was, like, one of the main settings. Here now, it's kind of like, hey, you know, you're kind of free to do whatever you want, wherever you live, right? So if you happen to live in some smaller, you know, rural town, then, hey, by all means, adapt your town to, you know, a, a setting like this, to uh, to create your own kind of background. And I think that'd be kind of, that's pretty cool. So 
as opposed to it's like, oh, well, you should set your your game in New York or Seattle or something like that. There's a lot of cool information here about creating like right here, your city by night. All right. So anyway, so what I was going to start to say is that the way the mechanics are in this new edition to me seems like there's there's more of a penalty on failure than you would see in some other role-playing games. And the reason why I mentioned this is that reading through the rules here, like for an example, like hunger, the hunger mechanic. So the higher your hunger level is, the more you're going to risk exposing yourself, like, like losing it or going, you know, going, becoming crazed and attacking somebody so you can feed on them, right? Um, so it kind of gets to the point where when you're at that, you know, at that hunger, you know, a hunger level or where things are like looking like, well, you know, if I roll these dice, it's looking pretty iffy. It looks like I, I might, uh, I might fail this roll. Kind of gets you into the, to the mind, <laughs> mind frame of, well, then I, I guess I better not do anything. I better not do anything that requires me to roll some dice because the price of failure is so high. Whereas, uh, let's say a Powered by the Apocalypse game, let's say like for an example, like Dungeon World, right? You gain experience by failure. That's that's one of the main ways that you gain experience is by failure. If you look at Call of Cthulhu, right? Success allows you, using a skill, for example, using a skill successfully in the midst of an adventure where succeeding in that skill actually does something to the story. It's, you know, it's advantageous to the story. You're going to mark that and you're going to have the opportunity to gain experience to increase that skill level. So it rewards you for taking risks. A lot of Powered by the Apocalypse games reward the player characters and the players themselves for taking risks. This system, the way it's kind of set up, kind of, and I know there are a lot of role players out there who it's like, hey, you know what? I'd rather just sit back, not kind of do anything because I'd rather not roll dice and fail. I mean, that's that's just that's just the thing, right? You have some players, it doesn't matter if you're playing D&D &D or Pathfinder or what. People are going to be like, okay, um, I'm turtling up here because I don't want the possibility of failure to, <laughs> to raise its ugly head, which actually ends up putting a whole lot of pressure on the game master to kind of keep the story moving to make the story entertaining as opposed to the players kind of doing their part. So I, I do kind of get that vibe a little bit from the way that the, the mechanics are set up in five uh, V five, I guess I'll say. So then we got tools talking about different kind of NPCs, the antagonists kind of flipping on through different creatures. We've got a little bit of a BC area, not much different items. Then we've got uh, some examples, both of uh, settings and characters. Sect War Veteran, The Week of Nightmares. All right, and then we got an index. And then we've got, uh, we've got that code that I'm gonna give away. <laughs> so, uh, so taking a look through Vampire, the Masquerade 5th Edition. What are my thoughts overall about the game? So I'll get rid of these, take a quick sip. All right, so I already pointed out this is for a very mature audience. Not very mature. It's for 18 and over. You're going to make the game what you want to make the game, right? So there's that golden rule that there are no rules. You just make vampire the way you want it to be. Now, some people are going to love that aspect. They're going to love how it's much more sandboxy than, say, past editions of Vampire. There isn't so much of that meta plot involved as it was in the past. Some people will like that. Other people won't. People who were really big fans of the fiction of the game world are probably not going to be too thrilled. But then again, there's still other versions of Vampire that are being supported. So it's not as if Vampire the Requiem is going to disappear just because 
fifth edition Vampire the Masquerade is out. So keep that in mind too. So uh, the Onyx Path is uh, is still, you know, releasing stuff. In fact, I think they've got a new book that's out right now for uh, Vampire... Is, I think it's Vampire Requiem, I think. So uh, rules-wise, rules-wise is a little crunchier than I remember it being, but it's still pretty rules light. You've pretty much got your dice pools. You're rolling 10-sided dice. Six and above is a success. If you get a 10, then you're looking at, okay, well, that's a really good success. If you get more than one 10, you're actually doubling those up. So let's say if you roll, you know, eight dice and you get three tens, well, then that counts as six successes. So I thought, you know, it's not an exploding die mechanic, but a little bit like an exploding die. You're not rolling more dice. You're just saying, oh, I'm doubling up those successes on the tens. Uh, you're just setting it against a difficulty number. There are some things that, um, some aspects to the game where they're kind of treading in territory that I'm not overly comfortable with. That's just me, you know, I, and I've run horror role playing for a long, long time, but it, it starts stepping into some directions that I don't like to approach at my gaming table. But once again, even though it's not in this core book, there is that discussion of how to approach tricky or uncomfortable uh, material at your game table. That is part of the PDF, the, the extra download. Uh, or the material that is part of the PDF itself. I really do think that Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition is going to be very divisive for fans of Vampire. I think some folks are really going to like it. I think some folks are not going to like it and they're going to just stick to the previous editions that they're playing with. And I, I think that's fine. As I mentioned, when I started the review, the way I approach this is... As someone who is new to Vampire, is this going to kind of explain the background, give you the kind of the, the situation of the setting? Are the rules easy to understand? Is this is this going to be, uh, is this a game world I would want to play in? Is it a game world I want to play in? I don't know. I got to be honest. I don't know, because like I said, it kind of, it, you know, it touches on territory that I'm not all that comfortable with. But that doesn't mean that that couldn't be taken out of my campaign, right, that I play in. Uh, one thing I found about reading through the book, you know, in big chunks is that it there's kind of a disconnect between the different sections of the book. And it's almost like it could have used another level or two of proofreading and editing because there's like a disconnect. It, it doesn't flow. And you can you can tell, okay, this section here, this was written by one person. And this section over here, written by somebody completely different. They, it doesn't carry the same voice throughout the whole book, which I found a little strange. But in my opinion, I think the hardcover book was probably rushed out a little undercooked. That... Um, and it might be why this, this hardcover is not for sale on the World of Darkness website right now. There could be another edition, kind of an updated edition being prepared. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I thought that was kind of weird. But I personally think this new fifth edition does what it sets out to do, right? Uh, I think there's loads and loads of background. It's very interesting. I don't, I can't tell you like, how it's going to be different than like the 20th anniversary edition or whatever clan books that you've read in the past. I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. But I can tell you as somebody who would be coming to this system fresh, yeah, the book does does do what it sets out to do. So uh, mechanics are pretty, pretty easy. I would say that things aren't necessarily presented as logically throughout the rule book as I would have liked to have seen. There's... I think it'd be kind of tough to run this for the first few times for a game master having to, cause you're going to have like flip back and forth constantly through different sections of this book, even though there is an index, it's not as intuitive as I would have liked, but that doesn't make it bad. Um, so all in all, I like it. I just, 
don't think I would run it. At least I wouldn't run it the way it's presented. So, that being said, on a scale of 1 to 10, I give the new 5th edition of Vampire the Masquerade an 8.1 out of 10. I think the production quality is really, really well done. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the photography, but that's just, you know, that's just personal, right? Uh, I think the mechanics, it's still a rules light system. A little bit more crunch than I recall in the original Vampire the Masquerade, but I have no problem with that. And it should be fairly interesting and not all that difficult for new players or longtime role players who are new to Vampire the Masquerade to get on board with this new edition. Uh, as far as utilizing this for LARPs, I don't, I don't know. I can't tell you because I don't really, I know that and that is a big aspect of uh, vampire fans out there is the LARPing aspect of it. I don't know. I think it's probably got a little more crunch. So I think it'd be a little tough to uh, kind of adapt a lot of this to, um, to live action role playing, at least mechanically. So there you have it. That is it for today's show. As I mentioned on tomorrow's show, I am going to be taking a look at the new second edition to Block by Block, the Insurrection game. Uh, as I mentioned, I did a an in-depth preview for the Kickstarter, so we're going to take a look to see what, what we got in the box, what, what is showing up in stores. So that is on tomorrow's show. All right, so as I like to tell you, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com. For all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV, come on, by now you know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff MacLear. I'll be back tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. And as always, thank you very much for watching. Thanks again for watching The Daily Dope, presented by The Gaming Gang. If you like this episode, be sure to give it a quick thumbs up. And if you dig the channel, please subscribe. If you'd like to check out our previous episode, click right here. And if you want to check out a somewhat randomly selected episode, give a click right down here. It'll be like opening a box of Cracker Jacks. You just don't know what you'll get. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'm Jeff McAleer.